we just rolled out end-to-end -end decryption for our teleconferencing system. Now, all media packets are protected by ephemeral AES keys, which are rotated with each new video call. These AES keys are exchanged by peers using temporary RSA keys, which are also rotated for each call. This approach ensures that keys are constantly refreshed, enhancing security. Today, we will look at our end-to-end -end encryption implementation, dissect some of the critical parts of the Rust code, we will also discuss vulnerabilities and how we plan to patch them. So what's end-to-end -end encryption and why did we need it for our teleconferencing system? I think that the best way to explain this is with an example. Have you ever wondered how teleconferencing software is able to record your calls? The explanation is simple. Even when the call is encrypted in transit, the streaming server has access to all the media inside the call. As seamless and convenient as it is, not all of us feel comfortable knowing that the El Gran Hermano is listening. Imagine you are receiving psychological therapy over a video call. Would you feel comfortable knowing that every word you say might be recorded by a company, stored on a server indefinitely, and perhaps even used by a random developer to train artificial intelligence? End-to-end -end encryption is a method of secure communication that prevents third parties from accessing data while it's transferred from one end system or device to another. With regards to our therapy over the internet scenario, there are laws that protect patients around the world. One of them is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. HIPAA is a US law that provides privacy standards to protect patients' medical records and other health information. If a video call between a health provider and a patient contains personal information, then they must be treated with the same level of protection as other health information. This includes implementing appropriate administrative, physical, and technical safeguards to ensure the confidentiality, integrity, and security of the information. And this is why, if you are a healthcare provider and use Zoom to meet patients, you need to get a BAA or Business Associate Agreement in place with the company to ensure complete protection of personal health information. And this usually means that you need to turn off the video call recording feature on the server side. Some commercial teleconferencing systems do offer end-to-end -end encryption. One example of that will be Zoom. Sadly, they do not share their code, so it's extremely hard to guarantee that their implementation is correct. We instead recommend looking at Jitsi. End-to-end -end encryption in Jitsi is implemented by adding an extra layer of encryption, that is, encrypting the audio-video metadata at the source, before it is encrypted with DTLS SRTP. This way, when the SFU decrypts the DTLS SRTP payload, it will not be able to access the actual media contained within the payload. SFU stands for a Selective Forwarding Unit, and it's effectively the Jitsi backend. We architected our system so that similarly to Jitsi, it encrypts the audio-video media at the source using AES. Contrary to proprietary software, you do not have to take my word for it. You can trust but verify and look at the source code. Let me walk you through how we implemented end-to-end -end encryption, starting by the two most important requirements that we had in mind. Users shouldn't have to do extra work to use end-to-end -end encryption. It should be the default. And number two, it should be hard to turn off end-to-end -end encryption, or even better, impossible. This means that you do not need to share any secrets out of band or clicking on a secret end-to-end -end box buried in the settings. It should just work. It should just always work. For now, we are using AES-128. This means that the key has two to the power of 128 combinations. Let us know in the comments if you think that this is enough or if we should bump it to AES-256, which should give us 2 to the power of 256 combinations. We know that it is possible to break AES, but until we have quantum computers, the cost of breaking it is proportional to the length of the key. What we are counting on is that the cost of breaking it exceeds the potential benefit. We are using the AES crate. We generate a new burner AES key for each call. Here's the code for that. Do you think that the way that we are selecting the key and initialization vector is secure? Let us know in the comments. It is important to mention that at the moment of recording, we are using AES without GCM. From what I know, GCM or Galois counter mode adds authentication to ensure that if anyone alters a bit of the encrypted message, the decryption will detect this change and reject the message. 
I filed a ticket in the GitHub repo so that we can explore this solution and see if it's worth it. Okay, so we established that AES keys are used to encrypt our media packets. The next question is, how do we share those keys securely? We decided to use RSA for this. Say there are two peers in a call, Alice and Bob. As soon as Alice and Bob connect to the call, they generate the burner RSA keeper. Do you consider that this keeper generation function is secure? Let us know in the comments. After generating the keeper, they exchange their public keys using the web transport connection. Our key exchange protocol is super simple. When Bob detects that Alice joins the call, he immediately sends his public key to Alice. Upon receiving the packet, Alice trusts the packet at face value. Alice then uses Bob's public key to encrypt its own AES key and initialization vector and sends it over. Keep in mind that we added a section with known vulnerabilities, so bear with us here. Then Bob receives the encrypted message and attempts to decrypt it like this. If successful, then Bob stores the AES key into a hash map. Whenever Ali sends a media packet to Bob, Bob uses this key to decrypt the packets. If, for some reason, Bob fails to decrypt the packet, then it removes Ali's keys, just like if Ali left the call. Upon receiving a new packet from Alice, we restart the key exchange process. We believe that this is a very simple yet powerful algorithm. I already found some kinks and I am looking for your help to address them. So I found at least two vulnerabilities or two flaws in our current design. The first one is a clear man in the middle attack during key exchange. So when we were talking about key exchange, remember that I said that peers accept the public key at face value. And that's exactly the problem. They should use some sort of third party digital signatures or some other mechanism to ensure that the key issuer is actually who you think it is. And this points us to the second flaw, which is the lack of authorization and authentication. Right now, we do not request users to authenticate. That means that you can choose any user ID that you feel like, like Obama maybe, and join any call. I feel that authentication and authorization are solved issues, and I feel proud that we, as a company, decided to not focus on these problems until now. Let us know which kind of OAuth providers would you like us to integrate with, such as logging with Apple, Mastodon, logging with Google, etc. Please share your experience using Russellmania in the comments. This is Security Union.